once around Canopus. The Canopus is the second brightest star in all of the sky, second only to Sirius. It's the brightest star in the constellation of Carina in the Southern Hemisphere, and therefore gets the designation Alpha Carinae. Magnitude minus 0.74, so very bright indeed. Sirius manages to beat it at minus 1.4, um, but uh, this is one of the very few stars that has a negative visual magnitude. Now at declination, minus 52 degrees in the sky, it's well into the southern part of the sky, not visible from the UK where I'm based, but I have seen it. I've traveled around to various places in the world, South Africa, uh, the Caribbean and so forth. And then from there, it's very, very prominent indeed and you can often see it riding very high up in the sky. Originally, it was the brightest star in the constellation of Argo Navis, and Argo Navis represented the ship Argo, used by Jason and the Argonauts, and was a truly vast constellation covering a huge area of the sky. I think there's something like 1,600 visible stars in it. Um, the name comes from the pilot, of Menelaus's ship when he went on his quest to try and retrieve Helen of Troy. Uh, so that's where the name Canopus comes from. And nowadays, Argo Navis is no more. It's been split up into three separate constellations, Pupis, Vela, and Carina. And Canopus ends up just in that corner of Carina. You can see the three of them and indeed, you could figure out how they all fit together um, and were fitted together in Argo Navis in the first place. Now, before the Hipparchos satellite was sent up and used the parallax method to try to pin down the uh, distances to a whole range of stars in the relatively near part of the universe, out to about 500 light years, estimates of the distance to Canopus varied wildly. They went from 96 all the way to 1,200 light years. And of course, estimates of its size, mass, power, etc., varied with those because the standard candle rule tells us that at a greater distance from us to be seen as the same brightness, it would have to be a more powerful star. It's too bright for the cameras on Gaia to be able to lock onto it properly and give us parallax from that. So we're still dependent on the value of 310 light years from Hipparchos. And what we know about it is that it's orbiting around the galaxy in a very nearly circular path, doing about 24.5 kilometers per second. And slowly that's taking it away from the sun at about 20 kilometers per second, the paths of the two stars are diverging slightly. And if you run the clock backwards about 3 million years, it would have been much closer at its closest approach. It would have been 172 light years away. So it's nearly doubled that distance in the last 3 million years and is beginning to get away from us. But in the past, it has also been the brightest star in the night sky. It's such a powerhouse of a star, and one of the most powerful stars in the nearby part of uh, the galaxy, that about 90,000 years ago, it lost its first place to Sirius as Sirius came closer. And Sirius, of course, is now only just over eight light years away, so a lot nearer. Even though it's less powerful, it seems brighter to us. But give it 210,000 more years and Sirius will have moved past us and away and Canopus will take over again as being the brightest star in the night sky. I wouldn't suggest you try and wait for that. Physically, it's a bright giant. Uh, it's an interesting class of stars. When you first study astronomy, they tell you about ordinary stars, main sequence stars. 
and then they talk about red giants and white dwarfs and red dwarfs and so on. Um, but the more you dig into it, the more you find the classification system has quite a lot of caveats and subclasses. And so this one is a bright giant and the spectral lines within the atmosphere of it originally classified it at the hot end of the F class, F0. But uh, there's some evidence that really it should be the cold end of the next class up, the A9 category. And so officially it's now an A9 having been promoted from F0. Um, F0, they estimated the temperature of just under 7,000 but now the modern figure is 7,400. And this makes it appear white with a color index very close to zero at plus 0.15. Now, some people have described it as yellow, um, usually from the Northern Hemisphere observations, because the star is very low in the sky and just in the same way that the sky is blue, the light coming in from stars at night, some of the blue light is scattered and the white minus blue is yellow. And so the lower the star is in the sky, the more the atmosphere tends to yellow it. And so we have to watch out for that a little bit. It's bigger than the sun, nine times the solar mass or thereabouts, maybe as much as 10, maybe as low as eight, depends which estimate you look at. And from interferometer measurements, where telescopes have been combined to try and estimate the radius of it, we know it's 71 times the sun's radius. And that high temperature, considerably hotter than the sun, and the larger disk means that the light output is 10,000 times as much as our sun. So uh, a white star, very powerful indeed. And of course, that's why we see it as so bright at uh, 310 light years away. Now inside it, going on right in the core, it has ignited the helium fusion process. So it's fusing helium into carbon and then carbon plus helium goes on to make oxygen, building up a carbon oxygen core, which is beginning to build in the center. There's still plenty of helium left in it at the moment in that core region. And then outside of the core, the residual hydrogen is igniting to burn to make more helium, which is of course then falling into the core as well. Uh, helium is denser than uh, hydrogen at the same temperature. And so gravity tends to pull the heavy elements down into the central region. So we're beginning to form a carbon oxygen core. We've got a lot of helium still fusing away and the star is being pretty efficient at the moment, using most of its mass to liberate energy. And for that reason, it is on what we call a blue loop. So the life cycle of Canopus started around 30 million years or so ago, and it continued burning away, turning hydrogen to helium as a blue-white main sequence star, around about 10 solar masses, gradually losing mass. All stars tend to give off stellar winds, which reduce their mass over time. So it's gone down a little bit since it first uh, ignited. But after that 30 million years of main sequence burning, it ran out of hydrogen in the core. And when that happens, the star has to reorganize. The force of gravity remains, but the energy liberation reduces, the star becomes less efficient as an inert ball of helium builds in the center. And so what happens is that the core of the star shrinks and increases in temperature and the outer layers of the star get forced outwards and expand into a red giant. So it traverses the uh, path from the main sequence around that little bit that's called a hook. We'll have to come back and talk about the hook another time. Becomes a subgiant as it's transitioning and then a full red giant and gradually progresses up the red giant line up to the tip of the red giant branch as is shown there. And when it's at the tip of the red giant branch, it can, if the mass is correct, 
undergo a helium ignition. The core temperature and pressure gets to 100 um, million degrees Kelvin, and that's enough to ignite the helium, triggering that helium to carbon fusion. Suddenly, there's a lot more energy being released again, and the star reorganizes and changes, um, increases its output, and goes on the trajectory of the blue loop there, with its outer layers increasing in temperature to uh, the sort of seven or 8,000 degrees. And that's what we think Canopus has done. After that, it will cross back across the instability strip because gradually the carbon oxygen will build up in the core and that will be inert to begin with and it will lose efficiency and again fades from being a furious blue-white colour on the surface. The temperature drops and it becomes red again on the AGB, asymptotic giant branch, which is a kind of super red giant where you have an inert carbon oxygen core and around that a helium shell and then a hydrogen shell over the top of that. And we're not sure whether Canopus is heading across the lower branch of the blue loop from being a red giant out towards the blue or whether it's already turned and is heading back across that so-called instability strip on its journey back to being an AGB star. It's uh, got a temperature of 7,400, so it's not at the tip of the blue loop. It's on either the upper or lower track, and uh, we're not quite sure which. Now, in future, it's going to burn as an AGB star for a while, and then eventually the carbon and other elements will ignite in the center, and it'll take further small, short blue loops and go through the phases building heavier and heavier elements up to possibly building a iron core, at which point it will suffer the core collapse and explode as a type two supernovae. Now, some references that you read will tell you that that happens for stars that have eight solar masses um, and others tell you anything up to 10.5 solar masses is required um, as the minimum for uh, a type 2 core collapse supernova. And that gap, the 8 to uh, 10.5, is significant because if it's below 8, we think it will fail to detonate and die as a planetary nebula and leave a white dwarf, probably the carbon oxygen core. In the range 8 to 10.5, it will probably go on a little bit further and make some neon and some magnesium and some other elements and may well form a slightly uh, different white dwarf, an oxygen, neon, magnesium white dwarf, or even some other very rare kinds, uh, but still just stop short of making uh, a collapsing iron core. And so I think the, the real limit is around 10.5. Now we estimate and the most accurate estimate of the mass for Canopus is 9.8, but there's quite a variation on, on either side of that. So it might or might not form one of these advanced white dwarfs, or it might detonate and produce a neutron star. Now, at the moment, very typical of these blue loop stars, it is producing quite a significant amount of soft X-rays coming from the corona, the outer envelope, the outer atmosphere of the star, which is heated by the magnetic field and by the rapid rotations and convections going on as all that enormous amount of heat is rising out of the star. And that this uh, creates a very rapidly changing magnetic field. And as with the sun, in fact, the corona ends up at millions of degrees, and anything that ends up that hot is going to give off some X-rays. In terms of companions, there is one possibility, Canopus B, and this was identified in 2014. There was a paper published 
saying that a red dwarf star was noted to be just 1.16 degrees of sky away south from Canopus, and it seemed to be moving across the sky with the same proper motion. And that is a clue that they are um, moving together. And so Canopus B was identified in the two mass survey and has that ridiculous catalog number, J062347385315138. I'm not going to try and say that again. And it's about six light years away from Canopus A, the primary main star. And that's a long way. You know, the distance from Earth to Alpha Centauri is only four light years, and Barnard's star is six light years away, and those are quite independent. But Canopus is a much more massive star, and so its sphere of influence of its gravity is considerably larger and it could well extend out to over six light years. There are no other stars that we know of of any significant mass in the region. And so it's likely that Canopus is the controlling object here and that uh, Canopus B is in orbit around it. Um, but I'm not sure that we are definitive about that. Now, the name Canopus turns up all over the place. Um, there are far too many instances of interesting cultural links for me to talk about them all. We have the battleship Canopus, a uh, pre-dreadnought uh, battleship of the uh, early 1900s there at the top left, as old class of Canopus-type battleships produced. Top right, we have Averios, who argued using Canopus that the Earth was round. He wasn't the first person to do such a thing, obviously, but he noted that you could see Canopus if you were south in Marrakesh, but if you came over the water to Spain, then it was below the horizon. And he uh, was very prominent in pointing this out as definitive evidence that the Earth must be round. Uh, the picture at the bottom left, that's a Russian satellite called Canopus B, which orbits the Earth, taking lots of photographs. And on the right, we have the Brazilian flag, which shows Canopus very prominently as one of the many stars that are illustrated in that central blue circle of the flag there. And I haven't mentioned planets because although we don't know of any real planets I've saved this till the end because Canopus is supposed to be the home of the planet Arrakis in the Dune series. Arrakis is supposed to be the third planet of the Canopus system. And so it's just it seems to turn up all over different uh, sci-fi, but perhaps most famously in this case here. Um, so I think that's a good place to end. And thank you very much for listening. That was once around Canopus.